Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on in childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. Hi, welcome to the Mind Matters Podcast. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. Thanks so much for being here. Just a reminder, Mind Matters depends on you to help us grow. There are a few ways that you can pitch in. First, you can subscribe to our podcast. Subscribing seems like a minor thing, but subscription numbers help podcast platforms like Apple iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, and others decide which podcast to feature and expose to a new audience. So if you'd click subscribe, it would help us a lot. Another way you can support us is by following us on social media. We like to use Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. They're a great way for us to be in touch with our listeners. We really enjoy suggestions from you for topics on our show. And we do social media Q&A on the show, too, to answer your questions about giftedness, mental health counseling, diagnosis, gifted ed programs, and more. And as a community, we can discuss issues and help each other problem solve. So hook up with us. Our page is Mind Matters Podcast on Facebook and Instagram, or you can follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod. So share us on social media or email our website to a friend. We're planning our episodes for 2019 now. So if you have thoughts or questions, now's the time to get in touch with us. You can email us at info at mindmatterspodcast.com. On today's show, differential diagnosis. A frequent question from parents who suspect their child might be twice exceptional, gifted, and having another diagnosis is, what should I do next? The go-to answer is usually to ask your pediatrician or mental health professional, but as we know, gifted kids are complex. Often, what we need to do is something called a differential diagnosis. It's a process of sorting through two or more different disorders when they share symptoms that can mask each other. Dr. Katherine Hassler is an expert in the area of differential diagnosis, and we'll talk with her in just a minute. After our talk with Dr. Hassler, stay tuned for some reflections from one mother who has walked this path with her exceptional child. On a recent episode of Mind Matters, the gifted guru, Lisa Van Gammer, I was the, the typical gifted kid perfectionist, not wanting to play with toys, but rather just organize them. I watched an episode of Hoarders with my husband. The woman being interviewed said, well, I'm a perfectionist. To my husband, that made no sense whatsoever. How could she be a perfectionist? And I understood completely because sometimes perfectionism manifests itself in this complete throwing in of the towel. Would you say that perfectionism is inherently a negative quality or a negative trait to be overcome? Are there instances where it can be viewed in a more positive way? So you've asked the most controversial question among academicians researching perfectionism. That's episode six, available at mindmatterspodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. When a child has a diagnosis on top of being gifted, a condition called twice exceptionality, or 2E, it can be tricky to tease out the differences. When we talk about 2E learners in the gifted world, there's a wide variety of potential exceptionalities. Autism, ADHD, stealth dyslexia, anxiety, dysgraphia, and that's just a few. Often, if we don't take the time to dig deeper, that second condition can go undiagnosed. It's masked by the giftedness. Another possibility is that the child's struggle actually covers up their giftedness. That's when the detective work of people like today's guest can help. My name is Dr. Katherine Hassler, and I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I specialize in differential diagnosis of a variety of emotional and behavioral issues in children. With kids who are really complex, whether they're gifted or they have another diagnosis, it can be hard to tell what's really going on. So to get started, why don't you tell us a little more about differential diagnosis? My experience over the last 20 years has been that often therapists or psychologists will just sit and talk with a patient about whatever 
the main concern that brings the patient in, which makes sense. You know, that's what they're coming in, they're concerned about. But that kind of drives the conversation that direction, and it may not always incorporate other areas of functioning that the child or adult may be having problems with that they don't even realize they're having problems with. They've just come to a point where they're used to that as just part of who they are. So a differential diagnosis allows us to presume nothing when they come in, presume nothing about a specific diagnosis. I start with an intake evaluation where I meet with parents and go over any concerns they're having. And then I move to my own questioning about all kinds of areas that they may not be coming in about so that I can hear, are there other areas that this child is struggling with that the parents aren't even aware of that we may need to evaluate to have a better, more accurate diagnosis for the child. Sometimes people kind of latch on to a certain um, symptom or maybe somebody else has suggested something and they do really kind of then, it's kind of confirmation bias. They look for those pieces that fit with that without looking at everything else. So what is the process that you use to complete that differential diagnosis? If it's a child, I have the parents come in without the child first um, for about an hour intake. And I'm very particular about having the parents come in without the child. Lots of people will meet with the child and the parents together. That lends itself to people not sharing fully because they're concerned about hurting their child's feelings about the things they may be concerned about. So So that's about a one-hour session? Just one hour. Sometimes in a more complicated case, I may have to have them come back to finish the intake to make sure we have a proper plan in place for them because we do create a testing plan based on that intake. The majority of people who come in for a differential diagnosis will come in for two mornings of testing. And I'm speaking mostly about the kids and teens because there's usually an academic portion of this for them. And we will do an IQ test that's appropriate for their age. We usually use the Westler scales unless another person has given them a Westler scale. And then we have other cognitive measures we can use um, if this is a reeval and a, a second opinion. We do an achievement test, an individual achievement test, typically the Westler. And then depending on what the presenting problems are, we may be looking at their attentional skills with a sustained attention measure. If they've already been diagnosed by someone else with ADHD and are on a stimulant medication, we will test them both on and off that stimulant medication during the course of the evaluation to see what that medication is and is not doing for them. And then we also have measures of visual motor integration, developmental, you know, visual perception, rating scales that can be completed by parents, teachers, the children themselves. Of course, it varies based on their age, what might be available to use with them. We also have personality measures for older individuals. What exactly brought you to this process? Why is this the way that you decided doing this instead of just looking for, you know, the areas that somebody expresses as an area of concern? Well, I'm really glad you asked that because that has been a big part of my career path. When I first started 20 plus years ago in psychology, I was on an internship at the University of Chicago and I had the opportunity to participate in an ADHD clinic, which was specifically about diagnosing attention and learning problems in children. And that really set the path for my career. But we, there was so much we didn't know 20 years ago about these kids. So I also was on a rotation for neuropsychology in kids. And so the two experiences together, I was looking at people looking at the attention, looking at the learning, but not always adding in the emotional component. And I went to internship more as a therapist than as an assessor. And so I was kind of unique at my internship in that I always was bringing up, well, what about the family or what about this emotional concern? And so it really became a passion of mine to try and separate out, instead of just looking at attention because that's what we're looking at or we're looking at, well, they had a head injury. If we're not taking into account the emotional and behavioral functioning of the child and the, and the family and how that's impacting the child, we may be misdiagnosing the kids. So what about high ability and gifted kids? I know that that's an area um, where you specialize. So how does giftedness complicate that diagnostic process? There's a school of thought in a lot of the people who work with gifted that they're just so unique that any behavior or unusual thinking pattern they may have is just because they're gifted. And I come from a different school of thought. There are plenty of gifted individuals who are highly gifted, who do not have unusual thought patterns or behavioral difficulties. So you can't say that it's because someone is gifted that they're acting that way. If it's because they're gifted, then they would all be acting that way. So we have to really look at 
what is it that this individual is experiencing? Is it they're experiencing a social disconnect because they're very bright and they haven't learned the social skills and we can work on that and use their intelligence to help them with that? Is it that they're just misplaced academically and so they're bored and that's why they're having attention problems, not because they have a problem with attention? There are different things that you have to look at. Um, with gifted kids, what I always tell people is that is an abnormal brain development. Okay, It's a great thing. Everyone goes, oh, I'm excited. My kid is really bright. But it is as abnormal in brain development as a child being intellectually disabled. There's no reason why we would think that there wouldn't be something else going on with the wiring that might cause them some challenges. So I work a lot with twice exceptional kids, kids who are gifted but have attention problems, kids who are gifted but have learning disabilities that are not going to be picked up by the schools because it still puts them on par with their same age peers who are just average intelligence, gifted individuals with high levels of anxiety or depression because they're able to think about things that other people cannot conceive of at much younger ages. So we need to use, and we can use our intellect to help them in therapy. We have to figure out what's going on and not just dismiss it all as, well, it's just because they're gifted. People sometimes come to you after they've been through a diagnostic process or been given a recommendation for a diagnosis by another professional. So what are some of the common errors that you see that gifted learners are are getting? One of the most common is, well, they're not, they don't have ADHD. They're just really bright. And so they're bored and, um, you know, their, their attention is fine. And I always go back to trying to explain to people that, for example, I use the uh, test of variables of attention, which is a sustained attention measure in measuring people's ability to sustain attention, control their impulses over what is exactly a 21.6 minute period of time. And the makers of the TOVA say in their manual that you have to take the person's intelligence into account when interpreting the data. But the printout that you get doesn't say that. So you have individuals who are not as well versed in assessment using tools they don't really understand. They look at that printout and go, oh, look, it says they're fine. It says they're within the normal range because they didn't either bother to test their level of intelligence or they didn't take it into account in interpreting the data. The impact of missing that diagnosis can be pretty big, wouldn't you say? I mean, if you spend months or even years trying to treat a disorder based on a symptom that was actually tied to a completely separate diagnosis, that can have really far-reaching implications. Let's just take a fictional kid. I'm going to pick a boy because ADHD is more common in boys. Let's say this boy is is seven and he's very active um, in the classroom. He gets up and moves a lot. He taps pencils. He talks to his neighbors, but he has no problem completing his work. He gets his work done and then he's kind of being intrusive with other kids. And so that gets labeled as a behavioral problem because if he had an attention problem in the teacher's mind, he would have a problem completing his work. He may not be identified for the gifted program because he doesn't come across as the classic gifted, oh, I'm being very compliant child getting, you know, and wanting more work. Or the kid may be not getting his work done because he's busy reading his book that is much more challenging than grade level. And so he's not doing the math that was assigned because the math was write out your numbers from 1 to 100, and he's already doing fractions in his head. So what's what's being said is this is just a behavioral issue. So then the kid is getting in trouble with teachers, with parents. People are telling him he's misbehaving and being bad. So he starts having a self-concept that he is bad. Then depression comes in. So this child, if he'd just been properly diagnosed for the ADHD, even though he was gifted and was given the skills was given medication to control the attention because it is a lack of dopamine in the frontal lobe of the brain. So this is a, a issue of, of brain chemistry. If he's given the ability to be able to control that, at least during the school day, the whole picture changes for him. How do you help parents advocate for their child when professionals, whether those are teachers in the school or other medical professionals, um, when they don't see that twice exceptional piece of the child because they compensate well enough with their ability not to not to show it in all situations. Well, that's really where my differential diagnoses come in. Um, I often have families coming to me who 
the school refused to evaluate. They said there was no need for it. The kid was on grade level with their uh, their grades. So there was no reason to have them evaluate. They weren't so intrusive that they were p- causing problems with the classroom management. So they're not having major meltdowns or being violent with other kids. They're just a little chatty. And so they're not being referred. But the parents know there's something not quite clicking. They know that we're struggling with him following or her following directions at home seems so bright, but isn't getting the work. So something is triggering the parents to say something is is wrong here. So most of the time I am evaluating kids who the school district will not evaluate. Sometimes I'm reevaluating them because the school district is not allowed to diagnose things that I am allowed to diagnose. So they only look at the impact on school, but not on the home. Schools have requirements for their gifted programs, for example. And because they have to serve a large number of students, it's hard to get them to dig very far beneath the surface with these 2E kids. Can you give me an example of how it plays out when an undiagnosed twice exceptional kid comes along and shows a weakness? So for a specific learning disability, and we're usually, when we're talking about specific learning disabilities, we're talking about reading, writing, and math typically. And there are different areas in each of those where a child can have a weakness. The issue with gifted kids is they have IQs that are two standard deviations or more above the average. But the school districts want kids who, for if they're going to diagnose a specific learning disability, these kids have to be below grade level. So a gifted child, in order to be diagnosed with their learning disabilities, and a learning disability is just a, dis- a statistical discrepancy between your ability to understand and cognitively work through problems and your academic achievement, presuming there's been reasonable educational opportunities to achieve in one of those areas. But a gifted child could be two standard deviations, three standard deviations discrepancy between their abilities and what they're able to learn, but they would never meet criteria for school intervention because they're just at grade level. So what happens is it comes out behaviorally in the kids, emotionally in the kids, They're avoiding work and people are confused. Well, they're fine. They're at grade level. Why are they acting out? Why are they melting down? They're feeling inside of themselves the discrepancy and how much it hurts in a way to do that work when other things come so easily. When kids fall into that category, they're often given a label. Their parents know and their teachers can tell by talking with them that they're quote unquote, capable of more, but they're not doing it. And usually the first thing that is then assigned to the child is the label of lazy. And I'll have families coming in, well, I don't want my child labeled. I'm like, your child's been labeled. The reality of it is, is a diagnosis, yes, while it's a label, it's, we're looking at accuracy. We're looking at what needs does the child have, whereas derogatory labels like lazy or that kid is weird, those are the labels we really want to avoid kids having. We want us to be able to help them with whatever their weaknesses are so they can be most successful. So when a parent doesn't want a diagnosis because they're afraid of that psychological label, What can we say to them to help calm those concerns? So when they'll tell me, oh, I don't want my kid labeled, but this kid is acting out in the classroom. They're having behavioral issues. The teacher's getting frustrated with them. I I help them understand. Your child has already been labeled. Your child's probably being discussed in the teacher's lounge. Your child is probably being discussed by other parents and whether or not they want their kids to play with your child. Sounds like there already is a label. It's just a derogatory one, and it's not helping your child become more successful. One of the most misunderstood diagnoses is autism. It carries a heavy stigma, and parents often know the stereotype of this diagnosis, but little about the wide spectrum of symptoms. So let's talk about that a little. The history of the diagnosis, the recently enlarged umbrella of what is considered autism, and how the diagnosis presents. When I started in psychology, we knew so little about autism. When I was in graduate school, the message was these are kids who are nonverbal. They're rocking in the corner, and you know the, the only thing you're going to be able to do is get some basic interaction out of them. And we have learned so much in the last two decades that there's a whole spectrum of autism that 
goes from what I just described all the way to very highly functioning individuals who are extremely bright, have wonderful careers in their areas of perseverative interest, but may still struggle with socialization with neurotypical people. So now, you know, when we talk about gifted kids with autism, the, the differential there is this is just a kid who they're very bright, so they have lots of different interests and they get very into them and they can talk about them in a detail level that other kids can't. Or is this a child with autism who may also be gifted or may not be? So what I've seen come through my office is people not believing they're autistic because they're bright. So they're able to talk. So that means they don't have autism. So people who have not stayed up to understand what we now know about autism. And then we have people who think their kids are gifted, who, because they have a vast knowledge in a very narrow area, and they can talk about anything about it, so it makes them seem very, very bright. But if you try and take that child off to another topic, they're not able to have that same level of communication with you. They will bring it back to the original topic, so they have problems with that pragmatic language of the back and forth with people. They talk more at people than with people. A gifted child who just has, you know, these these really intense interests because they can get really involved in things can have that back and forth conversation. They can switch to a new topic. So th there is a subtle difference. And, and it's really important to be with someone who understands autism to be able to make that distinction. I've, I've often seen kids misdiagnosed who came into my office with the diagnoses of ADHD, anxiety, you know, like like five different diagnoses when it, if we'd just considered high functioning autism, it would have been one diagnosis. And, and the important part about that is what kind of services do they need to become ultimately successful? And they are different. And no one stopped to think, gee, do we have the diagnosis wrong? Because for an ADHD child, you know, 90% of them approximately are going to be, you know, respond positively to one of the stimulant medications on the market. If they're not, it should be the first thing people do is think, well, do I have the diagnosis wrong? You know, your mention of intellectual curiosity and intensity got my attention. In the gifted community, we spend a lot of time talking about overexcitabilities. In fact, I meet people who have done their own research and come across this theory of overexcitability, but they use it to explain away some of the areas that should be concerning. I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of the theory of um, overexcitabilities, and that's just because I've seen exactly what you said. I've seen kids who are really struggling who people have just dismissed it as, well, it's just because they're gifted. They're just overly excitable. And I've had kids who were severely autistic that people missed because of that. I've had kids who were being impulsive and hitting people. And that is not what they meant <laughs> about overexcitabilities. You know, what they meant was these kids can think intently and deeply about often emotional topics that their same age peers cannot think about to that depth. So they do have, you know, a tendency to have some of that, you know, teenage angst a little bit younger because they're thinking about those things at younger ages. But, but we have to be clear. We have to make sure these kids are not also clinically depressed or having such anxiety that it's negatively affecting their functioning. So again, a diagnosis comes in when those symptoms are negatively affecting someone's functioning. So if the gifted child is, you know, a little bit busy, you know, they don't really like to, you know, just sit and do nothing. Uh, if it's not affecting their functioning, if it's not affecting their ability to do their schoolwork, it's not affecting their peer relationships, that's not a diagnosis. That is about that kind of intensity you see in gifted people. But if it is negatively affecting their ability to perform, whether that's socially, academically, you know, within their family, then we have to look at, is there a diagnosis here beyond this is a very bright person? People often put off going to the doctor because they're afraid of what they're going to learn. They'd almost rather not know than to be diagnosed with an illness that could change their lives, even if it's treatable or curable. The same is true with mental health. But with everything we've learned about depression, autism, ADHD, giftedness, it doesn't make sense to waste another day pretending it's not there. To lose another day or week or year, it's just time you'll never get back. Well, people are very scared of the autism diagnosis. 
people still remember how we used to talk about it over 20 years ago. There is so much more we know now. Um, I was once at a continuing education conference probably about 15 years ago where an individual said that academia, so people working at universities with their research and the things that they're into, is basically a sheltered workshop for gifted autistic people because you can get very into your area of interest and you can be paid and you can be paid well and you can just focus on your area of interest. So you can be successful with autism, but you have to find your niche. People being worried about the label, they're not thinking about, well, how do I use this information to help my child get into the best place for them? You know, our job as parents is not to mold our kids into who we thought they should be. Our job is to support the people that they are and help them be the best people they can be. You're not going to change your kid's neurological wiring, but you can help them find their place in the world. Dr. Katherine Hassler, thanks for talking with us. Thank you so much for having me. This has just been delightful. A mom talks about her experience with differential diagnosis in a minute. To reach the Mind Matters Podcast, go to our website, mindmatterspodcast.com, and click on Contact. Follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod, on Facebook at Mind Matters Podcast, or you can reach our YouTube channel through our website. Gifted kids are statistical outliers. When you combine another exceptionality on top of their giftedness, it can be really hard to determine exactly what is layered on top of the giftedness. A lot of times I see kids coming into my office with a diagnosis that clearly is not accurate. But they met with a single professional who did a very basic assessment, they checked off all the boxes, and the family left with a label that may or may not have been accurate or perhaps was only a piece of the puzzle. They end up with either a misdiagnosis or a missed diagnosis. When gifted kids struggle, it's often beneath the surface. Everything looks okay to the rest of the world, but the people close to them know that something just isn't quite right. Whether the giftedness or the struggles come to the surface first may determine the path a twice exceptional kid lands on, either in the gifted classes or the special education classes, but a lot of times not both. It's hard for any parent to walk this path with their child, but ultimately, while it is completely normal to feel fear, coming out the other side with answers is also very empowering. Here's a mom to tell us about her experience. He was struggling. He was struggling and we didn't know how to help him. And so we decided that we needed to get to the bottom of things. We needed to understand these big feelings that he was having and these reactions he was having. And he had shut down on his schoolwork and why. So we wanted to really just get to the bottom of what was going on with him and try to understand him better. It's a very emotional process because, you know, you're essentially going in there because something you feel something is wrong and you're putting your child under a microscope to be scrutinized and for somebody to come back and tell you potentially what's wrong with them. And when you realize that your child is different and wired differently, information is very empowering. So we wanted to really get to the bottom of it, but it was also a difficult process because as a parent, you want to protect your child and you love them for who they are, but you want to also be able to help them be successful in life. Some of the results were as I would have expected, but there were some surprises. And as a parent, having those details, it was really helpful to us to have a deeper understanding of where he was at in different areas, academically, emotionally. We did a full battery to understand what what are we looking at? I mean, we knew he was bright, but was there something else going on? Did he have ADHD? Was he on the spectrum? Was he, um, was he dyslexic? I mean, we had seen some impacts in his schoolwork and wanted to understand what was going on. So there were some results that were expected. I mean, he is a bright child, but then also there were some surprises because the results uncovered some vision issues that we would have never realized he had, had we not gone through such a thorough battery of tests. One thing I did want to say was that labels are tools. They're not sentences. Labels are helpful so we can understand what's going on, but it doesn't define your child. 
it helps you just understand where they're coming from and how they process the world. Because when your child is differently wired, the way they see the world is different from other kids. Their experience is different. And so, you know, I was real hesitant to pursue labeling, but it's been helpful because it's led to greater understanding. And then I have more tools to help advocate for him and help him be successful. I would just encourage families that information is empowering. And although the process is emotional and can be difficult, especially as a parent, that you just ultimately want the best for your child. And so when you have that information, then that allows you to really get to the root of some of these, you know, quirks or different traits um, and some of the struggles that they have. And so the information that you gain through the process is completely worth going through it. Thanks for listening. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and I'll see you next time on Mind Matters. So we come to Thanks for listening to the Mind Matters Podcast with Emily Kircher Morris. To learn more about us and our mission, go to mindmatterspodcast.com. If you'd like to show your support for Mind Matters, find us in Apple iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe and leave us a positive review. Start a discussion and follow us on Twitter at Mind Matters Pod or on Facebook at Mind Matters Podcast. Help us spread the word about the Mind Matters Podcast. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.